So uh, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And while we are very lucky to learn in this beautiful environment, uh, it is important to reflect on how our presence um, and our work can perpetuate process of, processes of colonization. And I think increasingly in light of the events in the past months, uh, we see how it's not only time for reflection, but also time for action to work towards decolonization. So this talk today has been organized by the Mobilities Group, which is one of the research group, uh, groups uh, within UBC Center for Migration Studies. And the Mobilities Group draws uh, from the humanities and social sciences to engage with issues of mobilities and immobilities. So I would like to thank both UBC Center for Migration Studies and the Mobilities Group for organizing this event. And you can follow UBC Migration on Twitter. Um, the Twitter handle is up on the PowerPoint slide and it's uh, at UBC Migration. Um, so we are going to have the talk for about 30 minutes. Um, throughout the talk, you can uh, post your question in the, in the chat. And then uh, during the Q&A, you can either use the chat or raise your hand uh, to ask questions orally. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Hoan. Um, she is an associate professor in development studies in the School of Social and Political Sciences um, at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, she has conducted uh, very rich research with Vietnamese migrant workers in multiple countries, uh, including Taiwan and Russia. Um, I found her work particularly fascinating and particularly helpful to, to understand issues of mobility and immobility. And I'm very happy that today she will tell us more about her ethnographic research um, on Vietnamese migrant trading um, at Moscow markets. And she will focus specifically on the complex relationship between migration, mobility, and immobility. So thank you very much, Dr. Hang, for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah, Anne? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my video? Because I cannot see mine. Yeah, all right. Good. Now, you can see um, it's, yeah. yeah. It is such a, uh, a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much to Gao Heng and, and the uh, UBC Center for Migration Studies for inviting me to share my research. Um, this presentation draws from uh, a book that I published in 2020 entitled Vietnamese Migrants in Russia, um, Mobility in Times of Uncertainty. Uh, but in today's paper, I'm going to look at the, um, the same group group of migrants through the conceptual lens of immobilities and it is a part of a special issue i'm co-editing on um, uh, entitled immobilities uh, a new normal sorry one second um, so globalization has um, uh, considerably changed the meaning of immobility mobility in the past used to be considered uh, a norm uh, taken for granted, um, uh, you know, seen as a natural, uh, an obvious state of affairs. Um, however, um, increasingly, it has come to be seen as a glaring manifestation of the stark inequalities uh, engendered by uh, globalization. And um, as the rich between the rich, the, the gap between the rich and the poor widens, uh, the risk and the cost of migration from the global south to the global north um, uh, escalate, um, deepening uh, mo mobility inequalities um, between the rich and the poor in the global south. And uh, it has um, um, become apparent that. Um, in migration studies, uh, we cannot only look at the accounts of mig migrants uh, and sedentary accounts are no less important than nomadic accounts um, um, in our migration research. And in the current frameworks for understanding uh, migration immobility, um, there are two that I would like to mention here because they have uh, 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 you know, shape 
uh, recent research on immobilities. Um, and in these frameworks, Carling and Shure uh, emphasize two elements, aspiration and ability uh, or capability, uh, meaning um, um, we, when we try to understand why people are immobilized or mobilized, we have to look at uh, their aspiration uh, as well as the, the, the structures and the resources that enable or disable their, um, their movement. Um, however, in these frameworks, uh, the aspiration to migrate, especially from the south to the north, is uh, taken for granted. So it is assumed that everyone in uh, poor countries would like to migrate to developed countries. Um, uh, and uh, in this, you know, in, in, in recent, in the studies that uh, were published in recent years, uh, this view has been challenged. You know, it has pointed out that in many globalized economies in the world, especially in the context of China or East Asia in general, or even India, Many people do not aspire to migrate because the opportunities, the economic and social opportunities at home um, uh, sometimes can be superior than those that migrants can find um, uh, in at the destination uh, in a Western society. And in um, the in the research on non-migrant immobilities, um, Poverty, insecurity, gender inequalities, neoliberal immigration policies, and migration securitization have been um, uh, highlighted as the main factors that immobilize people, uh, that prevent them from uh, migrating. And in um, um, immobilities um, research on, on migrants, um, however, uh, it has been um, pointed out that um, migrants um, are immobilized mainly due to the contradictory nature of globalization. So on the one hand, their labor is demanded for the globalized or globalizing economy. On the other hand, their personal attributes such as uh, race, ethnicity, nationality, um, um, and class are considered um, incompatible with the supposedly homogeneous um, and racially pure society of the destination country. And my case study um, looks at um, uh, Vietnamese migrants in uh, post-Soviet Russia. So uh, Russia has emerged as the second largest migration destination in the world after only the US. Um, and as of 2019, there were uh, 11.6 million documented migrants in Russia. But these uh, official statistics exclude um, undocumented migrants. And so Russia has um, is, is um, uh, known for a high proportion of irregular movements into the country. And Russian scholars estimate that about 70 to 80% of human uh, movements in the country, into the country are uh, undocumented. And most of migrants in Russia come from uh, the so-called CIS uh, or Commonwealth of independent states, the former Soviet Union and republics. Um, and the, the source countries outside the CIS include China, Turkey, and Vietnam. Um, Russian, post-Soviet Russian uh, migration regime is uh, notoriously exclusionary, reactive, and corrupt. So the bureaucratic procedures for um, obtaining a visa or for um, uh, legalizing your stay in Russia um, are very cumbersome and heavily corrupt. Um, and it is very difficult for uh, migrants to obtain a permanent residency or citizenship in Russia. At the same time, uh, foreign migrants in Russia have to cope with rising nationalist sentiments. Um, Migration has come to be seen as a security threat since the turn of the millennium, um, and migrants are seen as threatening um, the security of Russia and, and the uh, racial, homo, uh, homo, racial purity of uh, Russian society. So migrants are uh, extremely vulnerable to uh, racist and xenophobic attacks um, on, the, on, on the everyday basis. And these are the pictures of the three wholesale markets in Moscow where I did my field work. Um, and Vietnamese um, 
uh, first came to Russia in the uh, 50s um, as students, you know, the orphans, uh, war veterans, uh, war martyrs um, um, were sent to Russia for, to study. Um, and then, but the Vietnamese population in Russia didn't pick up until 1990, 1980, um, when uh, migrant contract workers were sent to construction sites, uh, government factories, um, and hospitals all over Russia uh, to work um, usually on a, a five-year contract. Uh, even though most of these students and workers left the former Soviet Union by, um, they had left by um, 1991, uh, a lot of them subsequently um, returned to Russia and often uh, bringing with them their friends and families. And, and the Vietnamese population in Russia has been growing uh, continually since then. Um, most of Vietnamese in Russia are employed in trade and commerce. Uh, they tend uh, to work at um, one of these wholesale markets in Moscow or, or, or in um, provincial cities. Um, and usually they live in Russia without work permit or legal residence. Um, and because of their ir irregular status, um, market owners um, uh, um, uh, impose a very exploitative regime um, at, at these, um, in these trading spaces. Um, so the, even though the rent uh, varies widely across the markets, uh, it could be as high as 20,000 US dollar a month. Um, at the time of my field work in 2014, uh, but because uh, migrant, you know, especially undocumented migrants have no mobility opportunities beyond the market or beyond the shadow economy, they have to accept this very exploitative rate, um, and the markets are run uh, with rules akin to those of the mafia, uh, because market owners pay protection protection um, uh, fees to local authorities and and uh, Russian police, um, and so they uh, could keep the markets outside the formal economy and, and run with their run them with their own rules. Um, more pictures um, that I took at the markets where I did my ethnographic field work. So in Moscow, I did uh, my research, I did my ethnographic research uh, over four years uh, from 2013 to 2016, um, mainly at the three markets uh, named Sadovod, Liblino, and Yushnia Varota. You can see Sadovod here on the screen. This is the red balloon. It's about uh, 30, kilom 30 kilometers east of the center of uh, Moscow city. But I also did a participant observation and interviews at migrant hostels, uh, schools, private homes, and illegal and legal government workshops in and outside uh, Moscow. Um, and I did in-depth interviews, casual conversations, and a participant observation um, um, at these uh, places. In total, um, my study draws from uh, casual conversations and interviews with um, 85 migrants in Russia, most of whom uh, were female, um, and 65% uh, 65 of them were married, uh, 78 were uh, undocumented. Uh, only five people in my sample um, had become permanent resident and two um, had Russian citizenship. And about half of these people were um, trading at the, one of the, the markets, um, and the rest uh, worked as uh, garment workshop workers, or they own a garment workshop, or they work as nannies, uh, shop assistants, um, vendors, uh, brokers, um, as well as office workers. So um, in, in my paper, I um, point out that um, Sorry, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, I don't know how to get rid of this. Um, um, migrant othering is a form, is a technology of government. So in Russian migration regime, um, highlighting the racial and, and cultural differences um, of migrants is a technology of government. Um, and in other contexts, when we read the immobilities research, um, we 
identified that the migrants tend to be immobilized by legal, technological, and uh, material infrastructure. In Russia, uh, migrants are less likely to be immobilized by legal and technological and um, material infrastructure, and they are more likely to be <clears throat> um, to be immobilized by um, discourse, by discursive and representational uh, uh, infrastructure. It is very uh, prohibitive to acquire a work permit in um, in Russia. So at the time of my field work in 2014-16, um, migrants had to pay uh, about uh, 3,500 uh, US dollars uh, for a work permit that was valid for only three years. And usually they had families with them. So if you put all these fees together, it's a very um, uh, large amount of money. So most people that I met uh, in Russia during my field work didn't have a work permit or even a dependent visa. And even um, in among those who uh, could afford to get a, a work permit or dependent visa, um, they were still subject to money extortion and detention uh, and harassment by Russian police because um, it was impossible for them to prove that they were living at the register address. So uh, the brokers who register them um, uh, tend to register thousands of people, thousands of migrants to one single address. Um, so, um, you know, they, uh, the, these documents um, uh, do not protect them from uh, Russian police. Um, and these uh, irregular legality uh, render them highly vulnerable to not only uh, Russian police and authorities, but also to opportunistic uh, criminals. Um, and Russian police and FM FMS, um, the, which is uh, the Federal Migration Service um, officers, they are um, authorized to conduct random document checks and, and anti-immigration crackdown campaigns on um, uh, migrants. So you, if, if you look different, you, you don't look white, you could be stopped anytime um, at the underground station or at the bus stop, anywhere at the shop uh, for document checks. And I was uh, um, uh, subjected to these checks a few times when I, when I was in Russia. Uh, it, and it's terrifying if you don't have a legal document, as you can imagine. And whenever you see uh, an article in Russian media about uh, foreign migrants, they tend to be represented as a problem uh, or criminals or a security risk. You know, the, the tone in the media about foreign migrants in Russia is uh, uh, very negative. Um, and so therefore um, uh, migrants um, tend to confine themselves to the ethnic bubble um, on the margin of society. Uh, they uh, restrict, their, they reduce their uh, local movement to a minimum. Uh, most of them just, you know, uh, go to the market to work and then go back home. Uh, many people that I interview in Russia had never done any sightseeing. They had never seen the Red Square, even though they had been living in Russia for 10 years, um, they never went anywhere. So they only, they were pick up at the airport when they arrived and home and the market were the only two places that they spend their time in. And so in my paper, I, um, um, underscore Doreen Massey's view that space is not some absolute independent dimension, but constructed out of social relations. So I highlight the um, uh, importance of uh, space and place-based experiences in shaping people's agency as well as their aspirations for the future. And in, in my paper, I ask um, what social technologies migrants develop in response to their immobilization and what social imaginaries arise from it. And uh, among the Vietnamese migrants I met in Moscow, um, immobility tends to be self-enforced, um, except for the uh, illegal government uh, uh, workers who were subjected to uh, police raid and detention. Um, these migrants tend to uh, uh, congregate um, in crowded, squalid migrant hostels or rented apartments in the vicinity of the markets. Um, and they uh, tend not to uh, do any non-essential movement outside the home market route. Um, 
and uh, there were no socials in most situations, like no birthday party celebration, um, no social visit, you know, just, you know, you wake up, you go to the market and you go back home and sleep and that's all. And any transgression of the ethnic boundaries is mediated by commercial brokers. So when you, uh, when you are in a medical crisis, like when you have to deliver a baby um, or when you have um, to send for your wayward child uh, from Vietnam and enroll them in one of the local schools in Moscow, you have to turn to one of these uh, commercial brokers in order to fac facilitate that process. And one thing I found uh, in the narratives provided by migrants uh, in Moscow is that their immobilities are um, highly classed, gendered, and racialized. So um, in other contexts, um, women tend to be found um, uh, to be more likely to be immobilized um, than men. But in Russia, um, um, the women that I met uh, uh, actually were more, more mobile than than men. Uh, they told me that, especially if they were pregnant um, or had a child in their company, um, then they were they tend to be treated in um, in a, a more civilized manner by Russian police and authorities than than men. Um, so uh, women tend to enjoy more um, uh, physical uh, spatial freedoms and and mobilities than men in Moscow. And because of the lack of con because of the lack of contact with local Russians, um, the Vietnamese I met in Mos Moscow um, uh, tend to have very um, tend to draw from uh, uh, sensationalized um, uh, um, media reports about the murderous hooligans, um, or or from the tales um, told by uh, former contract workers about the, um, uh, the benevolent Russian grandma. So they can either be, you know, Russian can be uh, imagined as either very, very kind and gentle, a benevolent grandma or um, uh, aggressive and murderous hooligan. And, um, you know, all these, um, uh, imaginations um, and 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 um, lack of communication, uh, lack of understanding um, and and cultural knowledge of Russian people further um, uh, prevent Vietnamese migrants from socializing and making contact with uh, local uh, the local populations, um, as illustrated by the quote uh, you can see on the screen. We Vietnamese can never become as civilized as Russians. I must admit, I adore Russian people. They they're gentle and honest, not liu mang, um, meaning thuggish or crook like us. Those who come to the market on Saturday and Sunday are so gentle and polite. Um, and at the other extreme, people um, tend to uh, be very fearful of Russian because they uh, only know of them through the uh, media reports about the xenophobic attacks uh, and the murders of Vietnamese uh, migrants in, uh, by hooligans in, in Russia. Sorry. And so all these uh, place based and uh, place and space based uh, experiences of immobilities uh, shape migrants' agency and their imagination of the possible futures. Um, um, and Russia is generous, generally seen as just a phase in one's life. Very few people that I met in Russia um, wanted to, uh, to, to reside in Russia permanently. So Russia was seen as uh, just a place for making money, making a quick buck. Um, and then um, um, lives were uh, put on hold. Um, uh, social relationships, family relationships were put on hold because people uh, thought that, you know, there's life waiting for them beyond the market, beyond Russia um, and, and, and back home. Uh, and so, um, you know, as uh, uh, illustrated by a quote from a 40-year-old market trader named Quang here, uh, Russia is for Russians, not for us. Um, and uh, keep in mind that these uh, migrants, many of these migrants have been living in Russia for uh, 20, 30 or even 35 years. And migration to Russia was uh, presented, represented uh, and described to me as the only choice, a sacrifice or something done, done for survival, for money or for my children's future and not for the migrants' uh, freedom or, or, or personal as aspirations.
And Russia was often likened to a big prison in which migrants are held captive by both hope and despair. So whenever I met uh, uh, a migrant that I had not seen for a long time, I asked them uh, how um, uh, they were doing and they said, so sick and tired. Everyone says so sick and tired. But when I asked them uh, when they plan to go back home, they said, I stay until it is no longer possible to do so. Um, so in, in my paper, I point, that, I point out that uh, mobility or immobility outcomes tend to be distributed along a spectrum rather than in discrete categories. So in migration studies, uh, we tend to see uh, migration mobility um, uh, as you know one belonging to one of the the two uh, extremes, you know, uh, or, or one of the two categories, uh, voluntary or involuntary. Uh, but in my research, I shows that the Vietnamese in Russia engage in uh, the so-called reluctant mobility. They are not forced by anyone to engage in uh, migration to Russia. But on the other hand, uh, it is a very reluctant uh, movement. They do not want to, to do that. I also highlight the constructedness situatedness and multi multi-dimensionality of migrant subjectivities uh, and therefore I uh, call for um, greater attention to intersectionality temporality and spatiality in our research on migration and uh, immobilities and the macro level immobiliz immobilizing uh, structures um, intersect with migrants gendered class and race imaginings of self, place and space to inform their everyday living and aspirations for the future. That's it. Thank you.